So from the name of this talk, I guess uh, you can tell that I care about four things, and those are policy dynamics, algorithms, uh, stochastic games, and mean shield games. And within the about 45 minutes that I'm going to do this talk, it's going to be kind of hard to give full treatment of each of those things. So I'm going to do my best to talk about policy dynamics and algorithms in stochastic games. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll try to explain how all these ideas can then be applied to mean field games. So let's jump in. Um, I suppose in Gerard, I don't have to really explain the idea behind reinforcement learning, but in the classical model with a single agent, reinforcement learning has this general picture where you've got an agent that receives its feedback information from a stationary environment and uses that in an attempt to improve its performance. So single agent and then stationary environment. Um, as reinforcement learning sees more and more successful applications in various fields, there's this push to actually <coughs> expand their horizons and apply reinforcement learning algorithms to still new problems. And so in some of these new problems, there will actually be other reinforcement learning agents present in the environment with you. So the left half of the picture was the single agent problem, the classical problem, it was this part of the picture. Um, but in these new uh, applications, you'll actually have other agents present in the environment and their behavior will influence the feedback, the observations and so forth that the single agent incurs. So the old modeling assumptions that we've made and all the theoretical guarantees of single agent theory are now on somewhat shaky foundations. If those assumptions don't hold, do we still get the guarantees? <laughs> So there are a lot of really compelling applications of multi-agent systems. And any of these applications can then be uh, an application area for multi-agent reinforcement learning, okay? So I'm sure I've missed a lot of your favorite applications here, but I've tried to include a few uh, general ones. Um, you know, I don't really have to explain the, the significance of markets, traffic networks, and power systems to people in this room. Um, but yeah, so it would be great to know what kind of guarantees we can make in the context of these multi-agent systems when learning is involved. Okay, and so some of my main interests are the following. Uh, I wanna give provable guarantees um, for, for multi-agent reinforcement learning and whatever the guarantee thing I'm guaranteeing is, well, this depends, um, but whatever this means. Um, I wanna design new algorithms with good properties and good here can mean a variety of things. And finally, and I guess the most mathematical of the things I'm interested in, I want to identify mathematical structure in the models that can be taken advantage of to do the first two items. So for good algorithm design and for proven guarantees. A uh, bit of a filler slide here. Uh, this talks about reinforcement learning and game theory. Um, and then some of the themes that I've cared about over the last couple of years include the effect of decentralized information, which is basically a given agent in a multi-agent system will only see a partial um, view of the entire system. And then that'll influence how it learns and what it can do. And then non-stationarity is kind of this problem of learning about a moving target where you get feedback from a target that changes, right? So these are the, the two big themes that I, I want to kind of uh, underline the research that I'm doing, or I guess, uh, anyway. So with, uh, <laughs> with that high level out of the way, I can kind of jump into the main model that I'll spend most of this talk talking about. And then hopefully at the end of it, I'll get to the other model. Um, the main model is gonna be uh, stochastic games. So finitely many players, discrete time stochastic games with full state observations. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. A stochastic game is given by the following list, which has a finite number of players. Uh, I'll just refer to this as either n the player set or n the number of players. I'll also call them agents. There's gonna be a finite set of system states I might sometimes accidentally refer to this as a global state, and that'll be a Freudian slip um, because I'm thinking about mean field games in the background, but states, system states, whatever. Uh, and then for each player, there's gonna be an action set, there's gonna be a cost function and a discount parameter. And I'll explain how those things work in a second. And then also there's a, an initial state, state distribution as well as a, something dictating the evolution of the state variable. So the play of a stochastic game proceeds as follows. At a given time, the state is uh, denoted by xt. Each player then observes some partial history of the system. Remember that decentralization idea from before that I was alluding to. Each player i will observe uh, history hit at time t and somehow use that to pick its action uit. It'll then incur a cost that depends on the system state as well as the joint action. So the bold face u here is every player's action taken as a tuple. Um, 
after this part of the stage game is done, the state transitions according to a transition kernel uh, P. Okay, and then the agent wants to minimize its series of costs suitably discounted over time. So sorry, so uh, can you go back to uh, can you say again what's the what's in the history? I thought yes, I, I, I can, but I'll tell you in two seconds. Is that okay? So this thing, this thing is like a super important modeling choice. I think this might actually be the next slide. Yeah. So if we're gonna do the treatment as generally as possible, like we can leave this general and tell you how the assumptions, like the assumptions can, can identify what the set of observations will be at time t for each player. So once you determine this, like you're actually imposing all of your views and biases on the game, uh, super important modeling observation. And some fundamental questions are of the type, like does the player see the complete system state or does he view it through a noisy channel? Um, does each player observe the actions of the other players and so forth? And so whatever I end up choosing will have to go into this uh, H variable. Um, once I tell you what the H variable is, which I'll do on the next slide, um, I can then define policies. So I'm gonna do this in like the general sense first, like treating these things as somewhat uh, are like abstract ideas. Um, <clears throat> a general policy is a history dependent mechanism for selecting actions with randomness. So you view your history and then you plug that into a transition probability um, and then you pull out a distribution for your actions and then you sample an action according to that. Okay, so this, this bullet is the short form and this is what you should keep in mind when I talk about policies in general. But in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about histories of this form. So this is determining what information the player has available at the time of this decision. And in essence, I'm going to assume that the player observes the entire history of states in the system up to the current time. The actions that it has taken, so all, uh, all the previous actions player I has taken, that's going to be available to player I, as well as the cost that player I has paid. However, I'm not going to assume that the player can view the actions of the remaining agents. Okay, So I don't get to see this thing directly. I get to view it only through the cost. And then I get to remember all this stuff. So these three bullets are, are telling you the essence of it. This is that formalism I was just trying to get at a second ago. Okay, so with the system state fully observed by each agent, um, I'm actually gonna narrow my analytic focus to stationary policies. A stationary policy doesn't use that entire history, but instead just uses the current state in its random selection of the action. Okay, so I'm gonna identify it with uh, a transition probability kernel, excuse me, a transition kernel on actions given the global state. Okay. And then it can kind of just look like this. Action selection at time t by player i depends on policy only through the most recent state. Sorry, Jerome, did I, did I kind of answer your question uh, a little bit in a yeah. circuitous way? Like I, I, I could write out this thing as being x0 ui0 cost at time zero all the way up to yeah, so forth. Okay, so <clears throat> some notational conventions. I'm going to use gamma to denote my set of policies, and I'm going to use a lowercase pi to denote a particular policy. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to focus mostly on the set of stationary policies. So you could view this as the set of transition probabilities on actions given states. And this is just an instance of that. To talk about objects that have basically are tuples with one entry per agent, I'm going to call those joint objects, and I'm going to put them in boldface. And then if I talk about a bold space object with minus i in the player index, that's going to mean take player i's part out of that joint object. So joint action, joint policy, policy set for all the other players, that sort of thing. With this notation, um, I can define player i's objective function as being the expected discounted cost in an infinite horizon sense. Um, and I want to point out here that player i's objective function depends on the policies of the other players. Okay, so the reason it depends on the policies of the other players is both through the state dynamics as well as through the action selection. <clears throat> if my cost depends on the policies of others, my notion of optimality should then reflect this dependence, right? So we get our first definition uh, as epsilon best responding to a particular policy for the other players. So a policy of mine is an epsilon best response to a policy of the remaining players if, it, if I'm achieving within epsilon of the minimum cost for any initial distribution or any initial state. Okay, and then I'll use this notation, BRI epsilon, to denote the set of epsilon best responses. 
So there's a deep interaction between stochastic games and Markov decision problems. And that is if the agent gets to observe the state fully, and if the other players use stationary policies, then the agent is actually facing an MDP, okay? And what's crucial about this is that it tells us that optimal policies exist. And furthermore, I can describe a Q function the same as I would if it was actually an MDP. Okay? However, this Q function will now depend on both the game as well as the policy of the other players. Okay? So I, I expect that this is kind of like old news to a lot of people that are familiar with MDPs, MDPs but I'll, uh, I'll put this on anyway. The interpretation of this quantity is that it's the optimal cost to go from this initial state when the player has to play this in initial action at time zero, but then follows an optimal policy ever after. Okay. So some useful facts then is that well, the first thing tells us that this is how you achieve the optimal cost. You just pick the action with the lowest uh, Q, Q factor attached to it. And then you can characterize epsilon best responding using your objective function and this uh, Q function. Okay. And the reason that's important and interesting from a learning point of view is that both of these are quantities that you can learn using stochastic approximation algorithms okay, under pretty mild conditions that are basically just the same as Q learning's um, assumptions. Okay, next, uh, and the final definition for this section is that of Nash equilibrium, or I guess Markov perfect epsilon equilibrium. Um, a joint policy is called a Markov perfect epsilon equilibrium, or just epsilon equilibrium for short, if every player is simultaneously epsilon uh, best responding to the others. So basically everybody is playing almost optimally against the policies of the other players. Um, and the idea here is that this is an equilibrium in the sense that nobody would change their behavior because they can't stand to gain very much by changing their behavior. Okay, so that's the, that's the end of the background section here. Now I'm gonna kind of jump into uh, policy dynamics and, and, and a new point of view on um, studying them. Um, <laughs> there's this cute quote I, I really like, and it's that game theory is somewhat um, like funny, right? We have this idea of equilibrium, but equilibrium makes you think of dynamics. Like how can you have a still point if you don't have something describing how points move? Um, and so, I mean, Nash equilibrium is it's a great definition, but it's just one solution concept. <clears throat> In multi-agent learning, what we really care about is what happens over time as players learn and adapt their behavior. So. Basically, dynamics is central in multi-agent learning, um, but Nash equilibrium doesn't reflect that. So I want to talk about these sequences of policies where players are updating their behavior. And I want to ask whether stability arises or not. Um, you know, does it converge to something? If it does, is that thing in equilibrium? Is that something else? Um, kind of an interesting question for me. Um, and then there's this also, also these like algorithmic concerns that I'm interested in that um, might or might not appeal to game theorists at large, but I want to design algorithms that scale well as there's a large number of players and so forth. Um, I guess simplicity is a big one because if we're going to explain uh, why a machine learning system works, it would be great to have simple algorithms that kind of come together coherently. Okay. Um, so I want to remind you again about the setting of what I'm about to present and it's full state observability, um, no action sharing between the agents, right? So I don't get to see what you did, but I get to see the state and I get to see my costs. And then this is kind of critical because it seems like in some engineering conferences I go to, um, there's this like inherent assumption in multi-agent systems that the system state is written in, as a Cartesian product. I'm not making that assumption explicitly. I mean, we could do that, but I'm not going to assume that. Um, I'm not assuming that the global state is somehow uh, a product of local states, like an end tuple. This is a bit mild in terms of decentralization. I mean, full state observability might be a strong assumption, um, but We'll study it anyway as a, as a starting point for studying decentralized learning. Um, we can ignore this blue box for now. I, I thought I'd throw it on, but this is going to come up again when I talk about mean field games toward the end of the talk, because I'm going to kind of go back on these assumptions and, and study a very different um, observation structure. Okay, so the other, in addition, so this thing, by the way, on the last slide, full state observability, but no uh, action sharing. In the literature, this is often called independent learning, but this isn't a uniform uh, terminology. Like there is some disagreement about what an independent learning is. Um, but it seems like this is the most common uh, term. That's one paradigm of learning that I'm interested in. And the other paradigm I'm interested in is a simple type of algorithm for updating your behavior um, called Wednesday lose shift algorithms. In a Wednesday lose shift algorithm, it does exactly what it sounds like it should do, 
You start with some behavior, you test it out for a while, and you see whether you think this is good or not. If you're satisfied, you stick with that behavior. And if you're not satisfied, you'll change it somehow. And you have freedom. Um, this is a class of algorithms. You have freedom in how you change your policy. You should just really stay when you're happy. This is like kind of the defining characteristic here. Okay. What I mean by satisfaction, I guess that's another choice. Um, in this talk, you can just take it to mean epsilon best responding. Okay. So here's a, here's a few works that use this approach um, and it seems to be quite common and popular and why not? It's a simple approach and it, uh, it seems to work nicely. So maybe I'll carry on. Another comment about multi-agent learning before I get to the dense material is that it seems multi-agent reinforcement learning in stochastic games is studied in one of two approaches most frequently. Either we study specific algorithms, so the most common of those being like policy gradients or inertial best response um, dynamics. Um, but there's also other ones like replicator dynamics if you're interested in evolutionary game theory and, and uh, things like that. That's one approach, studying particular algorithms, seeing how they work. And then the other approach is looking at, I guess, really application relevant classes of games <clears throat> and then mining those for structure and then taking advantage of that structure, either with those particular algorithms or some other way. So two player zero sum games obviously show up everywhere because they're extremely uh, good at modeling. Um, what have you, robustness problems or GANs or whatever you want. And then uh, teams and things that generalize teams into cooperative control and things like that also show up a lot. In this talk, I, I don't wanna study specific algorithms. I wanna study a class of algorithms. And I don't wanna study these well-trod um, classes of games that seem to uh, monopolize everybody's attention um, over the last few years. Um, instead, I want to study all wind state loose shift algorithms, or at least the possible use of wind state loose shift algorithms um, in stochastic games at large, maybe narrowing our, our view to a particular subclass that's different from zero sum games, different from teams. Okay. So instead of jumping into learning first, I'm going to first talk about policy dynamics, basically what happens when players change their behavior, and there is no learning to be had. Somebody just tells you whether you're epsilon best responding or not. So onto the, onto the math, uh, a policy update rule. I mean, if I say that term out loud, you should think something that recommends a new policy given a joint policy. I see that everybody's behaving this way. A policy update rule should tell me how I should behave next. Okay? So I define a policy update rule to be a function that maps joint policies to individual policies, a policy for me. Okay. Um, if you give me a collection of policy update rules, one for each player, then I can study the sequence of policies that arises by everybody taking the recommendation from that update rule. Okay, so the orbit of this thing hold T. Now, <laughs> in a win state lose shift algorithm, right, we stay where we are as long as we're epsilon best responding. And that is this condition. So a policy update rule has is epsilon satisfying if. Anytime my policy is an epsilon best response to the thing that the other players are doing, the recommendation is to stay the same. So I choose the name epsilon satisficing uh, to refer to the satisficing literature in psychology, wherein the idea is you, you search for something that is both satisfactory and sufficient. And if it is, then you, you're happy to stay there even if it's not optimal. So this is a rather, I mean, a, a broad class of policy update rules are epsilon satisficing because it doesn't tell me what I'm supposed to do when I'm not happy. It just tells me to stay where I am happy. I'm sorry, sorry, I think I lost something. Um, how do you detect that you're best responding in a, in a, it is a sequential problem, right? Mm -hmm. So is it best, how do you define best response here? It's not best response of the current theory, it's best response. To the policy that other players are using? In that definition from before, like like the sort of like that. Yeah, but in practice, when the when the system is operating, can you mm -hmm. detect that your best response? I think yeah, I think you're um you're a few steps ahead of me because now we're getting to like the actual learning side of things. At this point, I'm just talking about like um these okay. these things like as analytical objects. But, uh, could you just sort of show again the best response? Yeah, absolutely. And it's with respect to any policy that the other adversary or other learners are using. It's not their best, like uh, it's not their optimal strategy. It's just the one they're using at this Are you point. talking about for the policy update rule or for, for the BR? Yeah. So BR, it takes like the other player's policy as an input. Okay. Yeah. So this doesn't have to be a, a particular thing. This could be any dumb policy that the other players okay. do. 
Um, this, this defines a set of policies that are that perform within epsilon of the optimal. Okay. And do you will will the, the, the agent, maybe I'm skipping a few steps, but will they need to share their policy? Hmm. So this is, I guess, like a big question. Like when there's decentralized information, it's like, how do I know what other people are doing and so on? In, in this framework, it's just straight up mathematical objects without any, um, I guess, applied uh, correspondence. Okay. So in this world, yeah, you can you could say I'm an analyst. I know all the information in this uh, definition of the game, and then yeah, I have access to their um, policies, and then we can you know do a where we compute the value functions for various things. I'm, I'm like, these things exist as mathematical objects. At this point, there's like not really any learning or anything of that sort happening. It's as if we were doing an, uh, an analysis in hindsight. Yes. See it. Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, back to this definition. So yeah, so like the question I think was talking about these orbits, these sequences of policies, how do we check whether this happens um, and the answer is for now, um, an oracle tells us whether we are epsilon best responding. Right? So yeah, there is no um, computational check um, at this point in the presentation. I'll, I'll come to that later, like a learning check to see if we're epsilon best responding. Um, and that'll have to do with that relationship I was talking about earlier with the link between stochastic games and MVPs. So we'll use like basically stochastic approximation to estimate whether this is happening. But at this stage, it's just purely analysis. So is this definition okay? I probably shouldn't raise the head if uh, some, some good questions came of this. I guess I should monitor the Zoom as well. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. Okay, wonderful, thank I'll you. Let you know if there's something. Great. Um, all right, so yeah, so as policy update rule is just a recommendation for what policy to use next. It's epsilon satisfying if it tells you to stay whenever you're doing with an epsilon of the optimal policy, of an optimal policy. Now, <clears throat> an epsilon satisfying path is a, it's a definition I made up to talk about sequences of joint policies. So these are sequences of joint policies obtained any old way. These are just analytic objects, right? And it's going to be called an epsilon satisficing path if basically um, this property of staying when you're satisfied is preserved by every agent at every time of this. Okay? So if you're happy, you, you're, you stay. If you changed, it must have been that you weren't happy in the last period, where happiness means doing with an epsilon, being in your epsilon best response step. So that's, a, that's an, again, another perhaps like slow digesting definition. I hope that's okay. Um, and if that one was a slow digesting definition, the next one is gonna be terrible. Uh, so a game together with a policy subset, I'll, I'll say that it has the epsilon satisficing pass property within the policy subset. If for any initial policy in that subset, we can construct a finite length epsilon satisficing path that ends in the set of epsilon equilibrium policies. Okay, so this isn't necessarily, this definition here is again, like a purely mathematical idea. It is totally divorced from learning um, and it is not even attached to a particular set of policy update rules. Remember, I'm, I'm investigating satisficing dynamics policy update rules to see whether any win stay lose shift algorithm could be effective. Um, but if any of them are to be effective, it really should be that some of them can drive policy steps on equilibrium. How we find that, not important at this stage. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. And I just want to reiterate that this is not just a, a property, this is not just a property of the game G, but also of the policy subset in question. So if you want an example of a game with this property, take a potential game, and instead of the set of all policies, take this to be the set of stationary deterministic policies where we're not randomizing our action selection, but action selection has probably one for some action. And so potential games, we know we could just like drive policies to zero equilibrium by changing for best response. That would be one example of a game with this property and a policy subset in this definition. So I'll pause here again. This is a kind of fundamental for what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, is there any point I should, uh, I should talk about it a little longer? Can I ask about this? What do you mean by the stationarity of the policy? Like, a, is, it, is it like a is it like a time interval where it will be stationary and then will, it will change? The, yeah, no. Um, stationary policy meaning like the action selection depends only on the current state in a time invariant way. So no matter what the history I observed was, I just look at the most recent state 
And then I, I pick my action depending on that. I throw out everything else in the history. So I, I guess I, I should have said this earlier. Um, anytime I talk about policy throughout the rest of the talk, you should probably think stationary policies. And then this is just a relic of me copy pasting um, from before I made that uh, terminological convention. I have a question from the uh, virtual audience. Okay. Uh, how does the recommendation to switch capital T, maybe pi, depends on epsilon? Oh, okay, no, T. Okay, right. Yes. This like, so, mm -hmm. so the transformation, how, the, how does the recommendation to switch T depends on epsilon in this case? So the, the T is, I mean, in the first definition, it's just a function and it doesn't depend on epsilon. In the second definition, if it, if it satisfies this property for a given epsilon, it must mean that um, for this particular input, it has to spit out my, my own policy. So I, maybe I oversold it in the beginning of this talk where I made it sound like this work was gonna be very applied. So far, we've not done any applied stuff at all. This is, um, this is, yeah, thanks. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so far, yeah, this is just like trying to do analysis on games and I haven't told you. So yeah, this is, I think, as general uh, as possible for this type of policy update function. And it could be something silly. It could be like, pick the worst policy that you do. It could be always play some silly policy. It, it wouldn't then fit this definition, but you know, this is a property that such mappings can have. I, I really hope we'll get to the applied stuff soon, but for now, it's just analysis. All right, and then there was this definition of epsilon satisficing paths, and these are just paths that um, involve nobody changing policies when they're happy along this sequence. There's this property. I'll come back to that in case there's any questions. So the first analytical result, and again, I want to emphasize this is not a learning result, is that if the game has only two players, then for any non-negative epsilon, with this entire set of stationary policies, the game has the epsilon satisficing paths property within gamma s, okay? <clears throat> so initially I wanted to go through this proof in long, so I, I did actually include all of this, but um, I might go through it quickly just in the interest of time. Um, the only technical trick that I'm gonna use is that I'm gonna, re I'm gonna characterize epsilon best responding in these terms, right? If the maximum overall state of this expression is less than epsilon, less than or equal to epsilon, then we are epsilon best responding, okay? Then I'm going to define a function this way, and then I'm going to use various properties of this function from its continuity to its uh, equaling zero at uh, a best response and being bigger than epsilon if you're not best responding. To show you that a particular game has the epsilon best, best excuse me, to show you that a particular game has the epsilon satisfying paths property within a policy subset, though, I need to, given an initial policy, give you a sequence that lands at equilibrium where only unhappy people change their policies. Okay, so that's that's how this proof proceeds. I say if both people are epsilon best responding, then we're already at equilibrium and there's nothing to prove. If neither person is epsilon best responding initially, then both can change their policies, right? I told you there was no restriction on how to behave when you're unhappy. And so we could just one hop to an equilibrium by both players changing their part to their part in a joint, uh, in an equilibrium policy. So these are the two easy cases where both are happy or both are unhappy. And the hard case with two players is when exactly one player is happy and exactly one player is unhappy. So player I is best responding, or epsilon best responding, player J is not. And then to analyze this, I break the problem into subcases again, where I say, <clears throat> I mean, maybe symbols work for you if you want, it's probably easy to read it this way. Either player J can make both of us unhappy. Like player, player J can totally ruin everybody's mood by switching policies, in which case, Player J ruins our mood, and then we're both allowed to change and we go to an equilibrium. Or negation of 3A is true, in which case player J, whenever player J is unhappy, player I remains happy, in which case I can use that like machinery I was describing earlier, some continuity results, intermediate value theorem, so on and so forth, and show that in fact some policy exists for player J that makes both players happy. So I, I don't think I've done justice to this proof, but uh, there's the main ideas, uh, just a case by case breakdown. Um, and, and sorry, before I continue, maybe I'll stop and pause if there's any questions. But... Now I'll just emphasize that this was for the entire set of stationary policies, not some, like we aren't allowed to arbitrarily restrict that set. And I guess the reason for that is that it's important in case 3B um, that there exists a particular policy or in case 3A that there exists a particular policy. Okay, moving along. Um, so that was for all two player games and we got a kind of soft result 
Um, now, for symmetric games, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define what a symmetric game is. You can imagine that these things pop up a lot in applications where each of the agents has the same action set and basically faces a similar problem. And the, the link to mean field games will sort of emerge out of this definition of a symmetric game. Um, but it will not be itself. This is not going to. Sorry. So I guess maybe we can go back one. Yes. Um, one, I didn't quite understand why the, the, the previous case, why if they switch both at the same time, then you're fine. And second is what, what depends on the fact that you have two players here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, both very good questions. Um, one is easier than the other. The other is like, it takes some looking at. So the case, the question is, why is case two easy? And the reason is that an epsilon satisfying policy update rule does not constrain how you are allowed to change your policy if you are not epsilon best responding. So if you are not epsilon best responding, you can change to anything in the world. And now if we're both not epsilon best responding, that means both of us can change our policies to any policy in our policy set. Right? So we know that some equilibrium policy exists. So each player has a part in this. There's a pi one and pi two star. Okay. So I could tell player one to change to pi one star. I could tell player two to change to pi two star. Okay. And I can I can come up with a path that way. Is that does that touch on the answer for me? Yeah, it's probably the two I mean, basically, this whole epsilon satisfying path definition does not tell, like, there, there is no requirement on how you generate the path. It just has to be that you never change when you are happy in the first place. So if both are unhappy, all the constraints are lifted and we can, we can move arbitrarily, basically. The second question was, why does it matter that there are only two players? And it matters because when I do this case breakdown, if there are exactly two players, I get this nice, one is always happy or unhappy. I like the, 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 if n is two, the the case by case breakdown yields a very easy to handle statement and negation. Whereas if n is bigger than two, it's like statement and negation, and negation becomes terribly um, unwieldy. Like you can imagine if there's ten players, either the unhappy players can make everybody unhappy, or this turns into a for any blank there exists some player that remains happy, and it, it, you don't get to like basically punch the analytic machine Okay, thank you. And from the chat. Uh, I don't know if you prefer to read it. Hey, please, please so, uh, for a game like rock paper scissors, would mm -hmm. both agent converge to a certain stationary policy? So I haven't. Um, I guess the, the question of convergence has to do with like the policy update rules in particular. Okay, and if we don't specify what policy update rules are being used, then the answer is there's no reason we should converge to anything. So take a bad example of a policy update rule that will not uh, lead to convergence. Something that says do it a, do a full best response, a zero best response. If we're playing rock paper scissors and we start at I'm playing rock with probability one and you're playing paper with probability one. If I was to play a zero best response, then I would go from rock to scissors so I could beat you. And then in the next period, I'd be happy because you know I'm beating you, and then you'd be unhappy, and then you'd change to rock so that you'd beat my scissors, and then we'd cycle. So the policy update rule matters for questions of convergence of that type. Um, and again, this was um, an existence statement. Okay, and this, so it's more there exists a certain. Yes, policy. so there exists some policy update rule that will take. But you have to build a t function that you define. Yeah, exactly. And that t function can be really weird and 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 sort of hard to find. I mean, there's no there's no claim here yet about how to make these t's. Later in this uh, presentation, um, if I can stick to schedule, I'm I'm running a little bit slow. Later, I'll I'll explain that. Once you do this, if you introduce random search over your policy space when you're unhappy, this will do all the legwork for us with a caveat. But yeah, so to answer the question, convergence depends on the policy update rule. And then from a practical standpoint, in a few slides, I'll explain that we can sidestep the difficulty by introducing it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, the next part uh, of this section has to do with symmetric games. So for, for intuition, suppose that you're facing a problem where Everybody has the same discount factor. Everybody's got the same action set. And our cost functions are such that if you and I were to, or if any number of players permute their actions, the result is just a permutation of the costs incurred. So in rock, paper, scissors, if I play rock and you play paper, then we incur certain costs. If you flip who plays rock and who plays paper, then you flip who pays what costs, for instance. Um, the second part of this is that if you permute the action, uh, I'm asking that the state dynamics um, are not changed. Like the distribution of the next state should only depend on the profile of actions rather than the 
individual agents have taken. And then with this def definition of symmetric games, um, the result is that any symmetric game and any epsilon non-negative, we have the epsilon satisfies the past property, okay? Um, if the last proof was a little uh, sticky, this one takes a rather different approach that goes like this. So I start by observing that in a symmetric game, if we use the same policy, then we will either both be epsilon that's responding or we will both be not epsilon that's responding. Okay, so it can't be that one of us is epsilon that's responding while the other is not. From there, um, I can construct an epsilon best, excuse me, an epsilon satisficing path by basically growing a cohort of players that all use the same policy. And then I'm just gonna invoke this lemma over and over again. Either everybody in the cohort is happy and I can uh, make the cohort bigger by taking somebody from outside of that set and putting it in, or everybody in the cohort is unhappy and I can kind of pluck that player out. Oh, sorry, and I can switch all their policies uh, to match somebody else. Either way, we hit a stopping condition either because we've hit equilibrium or because the cohort is all the players, in which case we do this one hop to equilibrium thing where everybody's unhappy. In fact, that exact same proof works more generally. So instead of the entire set of uh, stationary policies, I can do it on any subset that is symmetric and admits an epsilon equilibrium. Okay, so this is why I was, I was trying to stress so much at the beginning that this definition um, of epsilon satisfying path property depends on both the game and the policy subset. So this is a generalization because now it's not just for this game and that subset, but this game and any subset satisfying these conditions, of which this is one example. Hmm. That's sort of we're low on time, so I'm going to have to zip through quite a lot of the rest of this. Um, so in, in, importantly, I guess, there's nothing stopping pi from being a finite set. I, I wanna start now suggesting how we're gonna to get to algorithm design. Um, that set pi could have been a finite set. In particular, it could be a set that I obtained through quantization. So I guess, um, I, I don't actually know how popular this terminology is, but quantization, by, by that I mean uh, a discretization of the set of policies. Um, I, I metrize the set of policies, so I define a distance between any two policies and then a quantizer is a mapping such that um, the image is finite and then any two for any policy, the distance between the policy itself and its image should be less than the prescribed amount. So in this case, I'm using C. Um, and then a quantization is gonna be a finite set that is obtained as the image of some quantizer. So a little bit of terminology. Um, a set is gonna be, uh, uh, I'll, I'll extend this, uh, terminology and that notation to include joint policy sets. Um, the policy is called soft if this thing holds. I, I guess this should be um, standard if you're familiar with MVPs. But basically, a set is C soft if you put probably at least C on each action in each state. Um, a quantization is going to be called soft if every constituent policy is soft. Um, a con uh, excuse me, if two players have the same action set, then we'll call the joint policy set symmetric if constituent subsets are symmetric are equal. And finally, there's this thing about fineness. So yeah, I'm gonna have to actually rip through this a little bit. Um, it turns out that the cost uh, functional mapping from joint policies to the cost of a particular player, this thing is continuous. Turns out that this set is compact with respect to the metric topology. And so this, this mapping is actually uniformly continuous on the policy subset. And this basically has one nice property. So you can kind of skip reading all of this except for this part. Um, if you take a fine enough quantization, then you are guaranteed that some epsilon equilibrium exists in that set. Okay. From there, now let's uh, now let's go to this question of um, you know how do you get this sequence of policies? I'll start with an initial policy. An oracle will tell me my Q factors and my uh, my objective function. I will check whether I am epsilon best responding using that characterization I described earlier. If I'm happy, then I'll stay. And if I'm not happy, I'll randomly update my policy. This is going to the point of intelligent selection of TI. Instead of doing it intelligently, let's just do it. So I've got some random policy update rule. This can take my Q factors and so on into account. And then I've got the uniform distribution over pi. Pi is some finite subset of policies. Okay, Maybe I should take this out of the way. The question is, um, if I you know, set this stuff up, uh, I'm going to skip over it for time, but uh, finite subset of policies, some update rule, blah, blah, blah. Um, the question is, 
if each player updates its policy this way with information given to it by the Oracle, will the joint policy converge to some epsilon equilibrium? It will, provided that that policy subset in this game have the epsilon satisfying pass property, right? If the game has the epsilon satisfying pass property within this policy subset, then that, um, that algorithm I just told you will actually drive policies to epsilon equilibrium with probability one. Here's a quick proof of it, but basically the hypothesized epsilon satisfying pass property, which is a graph theoretic idea at its core, um, will guarantee that this time homogeneous Markov chain will uh, bump into one of the absorbing states. Okay. So yeah, in the interest of time, I'm gonna zip along a little bit further. Um, what was crucial in this was the Oracle access. The Oracle access was something coming down and telling me whether I'm epsilon best responding or not, okay? Second was this thing about um, epsilon satisfying paths and the finiteness was needed for the Markov chain analysis. As a corollary of that preceding lemma though, I know that if I have a symmetric end player game, by that, uh, op excuse me, the objective functions continuity result that I told you earlier, if my policy subset is a finite, fine symmetric quantization of the initial policy set, then, well, this thing will contain an epsilon equilibrium. It will have the epsilon satisfying pass property within it. This was the third theorem that I provided earlier. And yeah, then that, that process will drive policy steps on equilibrium. Um, unfortunately, I, I haven't actually shown that in two player games, there's a compatibility between quantization and satisfying paths. Okay, so at this point, I'm not telling you that that process will work for two player games in general. If they're symmetric, we're fine. If they're not, I don't want to make a claim at this point. Um, okay, so now how do I replace this orange stuff where an oracle came down and told me whether I was epsilon best responding? How do I actually, if I want to turn this into a learning algorithm, I'd better have some means of turning this into something that I can learn instead of uh, take as granted. Okay. So the epsilon satisfying path stuff, I know how to do this in symmetric games, you just take a fine quantization. Uh, this thing about learning is the next topic I wanted to make a quick comment on. But Antoine, I should probably wrap up sooner. I mean, we've asked questions, so maybe you can assume that you have more time because okay. you did a bit of the question part. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to the end of the stochastic game stuff within five minutes and I'll just, I'll just suggest how this links up with mean field games right after that. So how do I learn my Q function and my objective function? Um, to answer this question, I'm gonna borrow a technique uh, called the exploration phase technique. And what happens is on a given interval, so intervals are gonna partition uh, the non-negative integers and these are gonna have length TK each. On a given interval, I'm going to fix the policy that I use and everybody else is gonna fix the policy that they use too, okay? So we create this artificial stationarity within the interval. And then during that interval, I'm gonna take my feedback data, states, uh, actions that I've taken, costs that I've incurred, and I'm gonna use that to estimate this using Q-learning, and I'm gonna basically do an analogous process to estimate my objective function. And if this learning uh, duration is long enough, we would expect that these things should converge to their limits. And at the end of that exploration phase, then the end of this interval, I will update my policy from pi k to pi k plus one, okay? And this sidesteps the issue of stationary and non-stationarity in multi-agent learning. Okay. Multi-agent learning, there's a moving target. In this way, we've kind of created an artificially still target for short periods at a time. Okay. Um, this started out in games without a state, and then my colleagues extended this to multi-state stochastic games in a nice paper from a few years back. Um, this is common about two time scale stuff. I, I threw this in here because I know there's some colleagues that okay, but you're in the game, right? So like we are. these periods that everybody agrees with that? Yes. Yeah. So the question is why why are these players synchronizing the times at which they change their policies? Um, yeah, in, in in this 2017 paper, this was for a team problem. So this is like kind of uh, algorithm design thing. I could I guess you could also justify this in a couple other ways. Um, one would be in some applications there are natural off seasons where players just do not take any actions and that might be the time to do this um, post hoc computation. Um, and then there's this other thing, which is that I don't think you actually need this, these to be perfectly overlapping. Um, we have that empirically, there's still uh, forthcoming work where we're gonna show that you can, you can have these uh, learning phases uh, not overlap, exploration phases not overlap completely. But no, that's a, that's a very interesting question. 
All right, so yes, yeah, so this is the technique. I say this thing about two time scales. I'm gonna kind of pass over it. I know there's some people at McGill that are working on a two time scale approach. I just wanted to put this in uh, in case they're interested in chatting about this later. Okay, so now um, take that process I described earlier in which we <clears throat> update our policies using random search when we're not happy. Um, and let's turn that into a learning algorithm. So in the previous one, the Oracle came down and told me whether I was Epsilon best responding or not. In this learning algorithm, you start with some policy, you start with your Q factor estimates, you start with your objective function estimates. And then during an exploration phase, you receive your feedback and you do Q learning and you J learning for, for the other thing for the uh, objective function. At the end of the exploration phase, you can now take your estimates and basically do an analogous comparison to ask if your epsilon best responded. Okay. And if this thing is close to the objective function, if this thing is close to the Q function, then this answering this question is a surrogate for answering whether your epsilon best responded. If you're happy, you stay. If you're not happy, you update your policy in the same way as before, except now you're plugging in your estimates instead of the real values. The true value, I should say. And then we repeat this across exploration phases uh, indefinitely. So this is what the full algorithm looks like. The last one was a bit abridged, a little bit too, uh, too much writing swallowing in a little presentation like this. So skip over it. So under some assumptions, um, we can guarantee that something interesting happens. You can kind of ignore assumption B. This is a, a parameter restriction thing that's not especially interesting. The first assumption was to guarantee the epsilon satisficing paths property. I wanted my policy set to be uh, you know, a finite symmetric quantization full of soft policies uh, that also has an epsilon equilibrium. As long as this is fine and symmetric, we're happy. Um, Finally, there's this thing about the transition kernel. And basically this is a, a rather weak assumption. I don't know if it looks strong, but it's a rather weak assumption that requires any state to be accessible from any other state in some number of steps using the right action sequence. So this is not a one step thing or anything like that. Making these assumptions and using that algorithm that I presented a few slides ago, we can actually give an arbitrarily high probability guarantee of getting to epsilon equilibrium eventually. So I'm not giving you a rate of convergence here, but uh, you know, for, for large enough, exploration phase index, I can guarantee that, that uh, policy is going to be an epsilon equilibrium. To, to give you an idea of the proof, well, I think I've already kind of set it up and more or less knocked it down. Um, if the exploration phases are long enough, then the iterates at the end of an exploration phase will match up pretty closely with the limited values that they were supposed to converge to. That'll be true for both Q hat and J hat. And if this happens, then the policy updates from the, um, from the real algorithm will look a lot like the policy updates from that Oracle process that I showed you <coughs> slides earlier. Okay, We know that the Oracle process converges with probability one to set an epsilon equilibrium. That means with high probability, the learning process will you know, uh, be an epsilon equilibrium. So those are the main ideas. Um, I want to emphasize that the symmetry of the game wasn't um, the only thing interesting, you could replace symmetric stochastic games and assumption A by any type of game and any policy subset for which we have the epsilon satisficing paths property. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll let this linger on board for just a second. In effect, I mean, symmetric games are just a nice instance of the epsilon satisficing paths property emerging within finite sets. Um, you could do this for teams and potential games as well, for instance. Um, but these are rather well explored in the field of multi-agent reinforcement learning. And I wanted to highlight kind of how the theory of epsilon satisficing paths can be used for algorithm design, even in settings that aren't well understood the same way teams and potential games are. So when there's different structure than potential structure, um, you can still get similar guarantees. All right, so we, we ran a little simulation. Uh, I figured it'd be good to kind of wrap up this section of the talk talking about a simulation. This is not a team. Uh, in the first state, you're, you're facing a team problem where we both get paid $5 if we coordinate our actions. So there's a role player and a column player. Um, and they're trying to maximize the reward rather than minimize cost in this example. So state A, uh, state zero is a coordination game. State one is the prisoner's dilemma where you'll notice that action A zero actually dominates action A one, no matter what the column player does. Uh, if he picks A0, then I'm better off taking A0. If he picks A1, well, I'm still better off taking A0. So that's the prisoner's dilemma. Um, I won't tell you too much about the transition probabilities. They're not extremely interesting. Um, but basically, we found that, yeah, after 50 exploration phases in our uh, algorithm, we get 
that it rapidly moves up to uh, being pretty high probability of being at epsilon equilibrium. And this isn't with you know well-tuned parameters or anything like that. We kind of uh, it took minimal effort to get this sort of a result. Okay, so time unfortunately is running out. I, I still want to talk about mean field points. Uh, if you'll allow me two minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll rip through this. So earlier I told you that we had this observation uh, channel where actions were not shared, but the state was fully observed. And I told you that this isn't really a reasonable modeling assumption in a lot of uh, applications, in particular in mean field uh, games or large scale systems where the full state of the system is somehow an n tuple where it, it's consisting of all the local states for a bunch of players. Um, that's way too much to ask. And it'd be great if we could see if these ideas applied in, in other instances. Okay, so we also studied n player mean field games in discrete time. So somewhat different than the classical setup, which is continuous time and you take n to infinity and so on. Um, there's symmetric uh, problems for each player, but it's not exactly symmetric in the way I defined it earlier. Okay. Um, I, I told you I'd zip through this, so I will, but uh, here, here's how we would describe a mean field game. It looks kind of similar, but not entirely similar. similar. Um, one difference between my treatment of mean field games and the ones I've seen in the literature is that I will take a finite set of, of observations and I will give each player an observation function for observing the global state using its finite set of observations. I, I consider several different um, observation channels in, in my work, ranging from full state observability to the more classical one where each player gets to see its own state at a given time, as well as the empirical distribution of other people's states. So I, I kind of skipped some notation in the interest of time, but this, this mu thing is meant to be like an average state across all players in the system. And third, and perhaps most inter interestingly, at least to me, um, there's this observation channel in which each player gets to see its own state, but only sees the mean field state through a compression function. So you can think of something like Google Maps, where I don't get to see the location of every agent. I don't even get to see the, the real average, but I can see whether road links are busy or moderately busy or empty. So it's a lot more tricky to talk about some of this learning stuff in mean field games because that core um, observation about MDPs stops being true. So in a stochastic game with full state observability, when other people use stationary policies, I'm facing an MDP. In a mean field game, it's not generally the case. Instead, it's the case that I'm facing a partially observed Markov decision problem where my measurements are given by the observation channel and then the hidden state is given by the global state. Some natural questions are, how would these learning iterates, if I was to do Q learning or something like that, how would they be affected by the observation channel? And what happens when players use win state lose shift algorithms? Do we have stability in the system? I tried to make a point at the beginning that equilibrium isn't the only sensible notion of stability. Would we get stability if we had dynamics of this sort? Um, so yeah, so skipping some definitions, unfortunately, um, under that middle information structure from before, so kind of the classical one, um, I showed that we have equilibrium even when n is finite and under some certain conditions. Um, this isn't a groundbreaking result. The proof techniques are kind of standard, but it, it relies on something that's a, a little bit clever, even if it's not especially new. Um, after that, we also defined, um, so this, this involves no policy dynamics. We also define an algorithm for estimating whether you are best responding or not, okay? So this is a really naive approach to learning in mean field games, where instead of trying to surmise the behavior of other agents or estimate the hidden state or something like that, the player just naively runs Q learning and uh, objective function learning, treating its observation variable Y as if it was the state for a uh, Markov decision problem, okay? Um, so with this naive approach, we actually showed that these things converge almost surely with probability one, provided you, know, you assume this thing about the underlying state process. Okay. Whether the thing it converges to is meaningful or not depends entirely on the observation channel in the mean field game. Okay. But if you were then to plug that sort of idea into a Wednesday lose shift algorithm, well, we can we can come up with the definition, and we did for subjective equilibrium, where our notion of subjectivity is tied to the learning that we've just done. Okay, we then basically gave the same algorithm as before for symmetric games. We can use that in mean field games, and when we do that, we observe that we get stability in uh, in our in our system in the sense that players will converge to something where they think they're happy, but it won't necessarily be a real Nash equilibrium in some deeper sense. Okay. 
So here's what that algorithm looked like. It's basically the same thing as before. Please don't try to read this. It's it's small font on purpose. Um, but yeah, we have we have a theorem that basically yeah, parallels the other one. But instead of now converging to epsilon equilibrium, it's converging to something subjective. It's some policy set. Players will stop updating when they get there, but it's not necessarily an actual equilibrium. Okay, so these are the papers that I was citing. Um, one of those is probably going to be published very soon. The other one is still um, in the revision process. And then this last one, um, the stuff that I kind of zipped through in this presentation right at the end on mean field games, we just presented that at the conference on decision and control back in December. Um, so yeah, these are my collaborators. Uh, I'm very thankful to have had them as PhD supervisors. If you're watching, thank you. Uh, yeah, and then please feel free to reach out. I'd be very happy to chat with anybody now or later. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.